Welcome everybody. This is a bit of a first. We are starting this particular Facebook Live Zoom on time. Well, I think we're on time. So I'm pleased uh, to be able to welcome Bill Shorten here today. Uh, g'day Bill from Hi. Melbourne, which, which has its own challenges. Yeah, <laughs> my suburbs in lockdown. Yeah, still, I'm pleased you're still smiling, although we know it is, it's a really serious situation there. And our thoughts are with you. Uh, and a message to everybody, please, in New South Wales, remember to wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, do all those things so that we, here's the line, so that we're not like Victoria. Oh, my gosh. There you go. Yeah, let's move along here, Susan. <laughs> now, um, the wonderful translator we have here is Beck, who has been part of many events that I've done. Uh, and thank you, Beck, for spending the next hour trying to take our words and make them seem hopefully sensible. Now, I'm look, just so everyone, for those of you who are joining us who haven't done one of these before, look, I like to think of it a bit like Q&A, and Bill did Q&A last night. Uh, I'm, the questions, there might be some tricky questions, but it won't be anything like what Paul Fletcher got last night on Q&A. Uh, and so I guess I get to be Virginia Trioli and take things as comment. And the way we take your comment is if you write into the feed on Facebook, my team will be um, grabbing as many of those questions or points that they can, texting them through to me so that if I look at my phone, it's uh, not because I'm trying to find something more interesting to, to read, it's because I'm checking to see what you've been telling us that, I, that Bill and I need to discuss. So pop your comments in, but we have already had a lot of uh, questions and comments that have come through beforehand. So what we'll do is kick off and I'll have a bit of a chat uh, with Bill about some top line issues. I suspect we can't, uh, I can't let that first bit go, uh, Bill, without just a heads up, I'm going to have to ask you about robo debt, even though that's not the topic of tonight's discussion. Sure. But, uh, it's been something you've been such a fierce advocate on. And then we'll start going into all the questions that have come through. Now, if you have to uh, dip out of this for any reason it will be it will stay on Facebook so you'll be able to get back in and and have a look at the video uh, in, in warts and all so I think Bill everyone would know you are the creator of the NDIS without your drive it wouldn't have happened and and I guess like many ideas it's a, we all knew it was a terrific idea but how about we just talk about your assessment now as the, the shadow minister who is paying a really close eye on, on what's happening to it. What's your assessment about where the NDIS is today? Thanks very much, Susan, and good evening, everybody. And thanks, Beck, for the work you're doing. Um, the National Disability Insurance Scheme <clears throat> is a vision which says that uh, people with uh, profound disabilities and their carers should not live second-class lives in Australia. The NDIS, as far as I'm concerned, is not about giving people something special. What it's about is getting people who are behind the eight ball and getting them an equal go in terms of some resources so that you're not a person who relies on charity, but you're a consumer. So you're a person who has some economic uh, base. That's the vision about choice and control. Now, uh, when we set it up just uh, before the 2013 election, it was created by a campaign by thousands of grassroots activists. Mm. And my vision of the NDIS is to be the best in the world. Like I want us to be the best in the world. And in some cases, the NDIS package is, is have revolutionised people's lives. But in other cases, it's become a, a bureaucratic nightmare. It's become uh, opaque. What we're seeing is if people don't spend the money in one year, the margin that they don't spend, they lose the next year, which sends a terrible signal on how to behave. We're seeing a lot of decisions that get made without rhyme or reason. Things, paperwork gets lost, the people you're dealing with change. You tend, unfortunately, to have a variable quality of people you deal with within the NDIA. Some people are just excellent, like excellent. But others, and they're not bad people automatically, they just haven't got a clue. 
if they've never had special training in autism or uh, Down syndrome or, or significant uh, mental illness, they, they don't know. And if you don't know what you don't know, then you get decisions which reflect that. So I'm interested in hearing your experiences. Tonight, Susan and I can't solve every issue. We will no doubt have issues to triage. We've got a pretty good strike record. The word's getting out. If you get in touch with Labor politicians, we are good at getting answers, but that's not the way a system should work. You shouldn't need a lawyer or a politician to get something which is yours by right. And but I, having think, said that, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the most frustrating things for me, that we have been asking people to uh, not just accept a system, but to fight for every tiny little thing they get from that system. And in fact, tonight we've got people, we've already had messages from someone in Queensland who word got out that we were talking tonight and, and they've joined in. Uh, but that's the bit I think that disgusts me more than anything is we're just asking so much of a group of people who are already giving so much in as carers or as, as people trying to strike their way forward with a disability. And I think that's the bit for me that's unforgivable. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, Susan's spot on. She sums up how I feel too. The last point I just want to make in opening, but we'll have a good conversation, is I don't think people with disability are asking for anything special at all. But the point about the NDIS being important is it isn't just for people with profound or severe disability or their families or the people who love them. See, what I've learned about disability is it could be any of us at any time, or it could be someone we love at any time. Beautiful babies born, but you notice uh, as parents that six and 12 months that the baby's not coming, perhaps developing in a way you expected and milestones aren't quite being ticked. Uh, that could be any of us. Uh, it could be in the blink of an eye, car loses control, or it could be, you know, uh, just one of those shafts of fate. Um, could be for the onset of age. Um, anyway, so an NDA system that works for people, participants, is an NDI system which is available for all of us when, when life serves up uh, lessons and challenges that weren't part of our initial plan. Hmm. Um, it, can I just ask you, in terms of your what you've picked up from all over the country, from MPs like me uh, passing issues through and seeking your advice on how to get results, um, the the big the groups that it feels to me like there are some groups who aren't engaging in the NDIS uh, because it is such a, a complex system to navigate. Is I'm, that what you're finding? I'm detecting that, as I said, for some people, the scheme's excellent. So I'm not like a permanent rain cloud. I, I, you know, things are, can be sunny sometimes. But I feel sometimes that the more middle class you are and the more able you are to articulate your needs, you have a better percentage chance of sorting out what you need. It's still frustrating, still crazy. But if you come from a background where English language isn't the language spoken at home or, you know, you, you, maybe you just your life is such that you don't have the time to fill in the forms and go on the, go on the portal or, or deal with the revolving door of staff at the NDIA or a particular service provider, um, I, I think the scheme starts to fall away. And you look at the participation rate of first Australians or you look at the participation rate in the regions where there are thin markets. Or if you, if you have a, a family member with a rare disease which doesn't easily fit the definition, I mean, I think NDIS works better for some disabilities than others. Mm -hmm. Although I remember in the really early days, long before I was in Parliament, that I, the, one of the big things I was told was that you don't have to have a diagnosis to get the support that you need. And we seem to have lost. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think control. that point in the legislation where it's about choice and control mm -hmm. seems to have been subordinated by another clause which says what's reasonable and necessary. Mm. And now what happens is this price guide seems to become a mini... It, 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 the price, price guide's like the Bible, mm -hmm. but it's almost replaced God. You know, it doesn't matter what God says, it's what the price guide says, what the Bible says. And... You know, I, uh, my Christianity is of a very basic nature, you know, love thy neighbour, treat people the way you'd want them to treat someone you love. And I don't necessarily need a book of, um, you know, 
written 4,000 years ago to tell me what to do with every aspect. And this price guide seems to be almost slavishly adhered to and there's not enough flexibility in the system to trust the common sense of people. Mm. All right, should we, should we start to dip in a bit more into those issues based on some of the things that people have sent through to me? And that's where I want to go. I do just want to ask you, though, and thank you, really, on behalf of Macquarie and the people who were impacted by RoboDebt for the work that you did on RoboDebt. Um, that, that caused so much grief, and I think I can't have you here without acknowledging that and passing on the thanks. I was at the dog park the other day with with my daughter's dog, which now lives with me thanks to COVID. And uh, one, one of my constituents just came up and said she was just so pleased to see that there could be some justice there for people like her. Uh, oh. She had been able to pay the debt, but it had weighed on her heavily. She was too yeah. scared not to pay it, you, you know, years yeah. back. So, so there you go. That's some of the feedback that I've had oh, personally. That's great. And that's why we get up in the morning and we want to be representatives it's to make a difference to people. I mean, Labor people and, and the community and the other small parties, they all campaigned on this really once it started getting rolled out. But um, what we were able to do is organise a class action. And that's what um, I've been pleased to do. I, you know, I know people and I've said, listen, this is not just unfair. I, th I think it's illegal. Hmm. And others have been saying it. So we've got a class group of class action lawyers together and now there's 60,000 people who've registered. And as a result of the class action with Gordon Legal, um, that's going to go to court on September the 21st, thereabouts. Um, but it's forced the government in the meantime, one Friday afternoon when they thought no one was watching, to miraculously announce that, oh, sorry, we've got this wrong. 373,000 people. Right. The population of Newcastle and Wollongong combined, the population almost of Tassie, everyone gets refunded. And it's a total of $721 million so far. Like, that is not a speeding fine. No. That is massive. Yeah. So I just say to anyone in the community, if you know people, uh, give Gordon Legal a ring, you know, uh, this government, if they say that they owe $721 million, my, and call me a bit cynical, but... That means they owe more than that. Yeah. And it means they probably owe more people than they've identified. So don't be shy about registering. There's no cost to registering the class action. And you never know. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And we'll certainly, if anyone needs to know how to do that, get in touch with my office and yeah. we'll uh, link you all together. Okay. The questions are coming in thick and fast. So the, the issue of reasonable and necessary. Um, they, I've had so many examples people have sent through to me. Um, Danielle has Usher syndrome and she was told it's not, doesn't fit the de definition of reasonable and necessary for her to have additional lighting, even though her condition means her eyesight is poor and she needs extra lighting to be able to see around her kitchen and work areas. Uh, she also said it's inconsistent that one of her um, friends, she says a, a fellow blindy has been able to claim glasses with plain lenses to protect her eyes from her 10 month old son. But Danielle can't claim any of the four pairs of glasses she has to wear just so she can improve her vision slightly. So this reasonable, you've already, already mentioned this reasonable and necessary. Um, oh, this was another really sad one that we'll be following up on a child uh, a family have a child who currently stops breathing in his sleep and is defined by doctors as needing overnight observation, but it's been declined by the NDIS because they don't say it's not reasonable uh, or necessary. So what, what is going on here? Is it, is it the interpretation? You know, what, what do you say is the core issue that's driving all these terrible decisions? Listen. My theory, my sort of case theory about what's going on here is that increasingly the NDIA has become an organisation which is focused on defending its own decisions. In other words, they've lost sight of the person. Hmm. Now, I'm not being mean about individual NDIA staff members, but it's almost like when you go through one of their decision-making processes, you almost sense they're just trying to cover their own ass in what they say. And so I, I think you've got an organisation which is almost disconnected from the people. 
and it whilst it was created to look after the people, it now just sort of spends its time justifying its own decisions. So I think there's a lot of risk management and bottom covering in the show. So therefore, what that means is that you're not getting a lot of individualised care. I think there's a lack also of accountability. I mean, first of all, just to finish up that first point, they don't give you a lot of written decisions. Mm. They say no, but they're not a lot of, it's not always easy to appeal their decisions because they haven't always said why. Mm -hmm. And that just sends off the warning, the, the alarm bells. Yeah. The, second, the second thing I think is that when you don't give something to the NDIA by a certain time, you lose your package or you lose the decision. But when the NDIA doesn't give you an answer by a certain time, there are no consequences. Yeah. Hmm. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's like those streets we have in Melbourne. It's all one-way traffic and it's not going in your direction. Uh, so I think we need to have more consumer accountability and more transparency and consistency on decisions. Uh, again, I also worry that they spend a lot of time interrogating the participant, but they don't always check the service providers and the invoices they're getting. Like, mm. where, where's the safeguard? So they know the value of each, you know, they, they know the value of each uh, coin, but they don't understand. Well, they know the price of everything, but not the value of everything. So, you know, I, I think there's a couple of issues of accountability there, which would be a lot more healthy for the organisation if they dealt with. And I'm going to come back to one of those. I just want to pick up a comment that's been made by a few people, including Andrew Backhouse, who says people who are blind or who have low vision are finding it really difficult to get Braille. Um, have you noticed, has you know, been seeing some, is that just something happening in parts of Australia? Because sometimes I find, there are, as you mm -hmm. say, decisions are inconsistent, but that's certainly something we're finding in this part of the world. Yeah, that's interesting. I just looking off screen to my advisor. Come in, Natasha, and say hello. So no one knows. Hello, okay. there's the expert we go to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And um, well, I'm sort of an expert. So yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't heard so much about the uh, issue around the Braille, but that wouldn't surprise me. But that's worth us pursuing. We will. And, and what I'd say to the people who made that comment, I'm very keen to get some more information on what you're finding there. Uh, and we'll follow that up. Now, just in terms of I mean, the, the government didn't get uh, radio print handicapped the uh, right, you know, some of the blind associations got themselves in a bit of economic strife, but the government hasn't, we've had to do a lot to try and get uh, the government to focus on this. So that's interesting. I mean, there's very simple things the government could do and make part of what we do. My own card, not if you can see it, but you'll have to tell me about it, it's in Braille. Um, yeah. I just think that we've got to do a lot more awareness. Um, but anyway, that doesn't solve the, the specifics that Andrew and others are raising, but I'm, no, I'm but conscious of it. Yeah, we'll get some more detail on that. Um, now, just on the other point you mentioned about service providers, uh, and I know I've got some terrific ones in this area. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, yeah, indeed. It's always the minority. Um, but Haley says she's noticed a worrying trend in terms of businesses trying to capitalise on NDIS funding, offering all sorts of services ranging from deep sea fishing to holistic meal packages. And, and she asks, how can the NDIS protect people who self-manage to not be exploited by businesses that are giving a good sell but aren't actually providing a, a good service? Yeah, I, I noticed when I went to the Royal Melbourne show, uh, maybe it was last year or, or maybe the year before, that uh, some stalls at the show had NDS, NDIS approved, but they were selling kids wigs and it wasn't uh, for people who needed a wig for disability purposes. And I remember thinking, what's going on here? So there are, I am concerned that, because the NDIS has expanded at a rate of knots, that it's attracted a few vultures and opportunists who are just preying on people. We're dealing with this shocking situation in South Australia where Amory Smith was left in a chair for a year mm. to feed, to toilet, to sleep. Mm. And something's gone horribly wrong with the care provision there. And, you know, the fingers have been pointed at the support worker or the care organisation, but... Ultimately, the Commonwealth hands these packages of money out. They can't just sell to say, oh, we didn't know or we're not aware. So, again, that goes to that point we were making earlier that 
they'll make you jump through hoops. Say you've got a child who's autistic at six or seven, has had the early childhood package, then moving to the school, they'll say that, oh, we don't have to look after you anymore. Then you've got scallywags and rogues who are uh, preying upon the vulnerable. Um, I think the Quality and Safeguard Commission is going to really have to lift its game. We found uh, that they had 12,000 complaints or matters drawn to their attention and only 11 or 12 suspensions of service providers or the particular service. Like, I don't believe that. And because I love the NDIS, I don't want it to become a laughing stock where they say that the crooks are able to just swarm in mm. and they don't have enough in the way of investigation teams. Yet the crazy thing is if you live in regional Australia, you have to pay thousands of dollars to get a diagnosis to say you don't need. Mm. Well, even if you live in peri-urban Sydney, yeah, you know, yeah. Sometimes it, you know, sometimes the access is makes it so difficult. Um, the the there's a really good comment here. Oh, okay, I'm going to do a shout out to your staff. Have got to go on screen. Mine's probably listening at home, uh, and one of the my constituents is saying Kim is amazing. She really knows her stuff. I mean, I think all MPs offices on our side of politics have someone in their office who has just, you know, got their head around how best to get outcomes. And Kim is certainly the person in my office who's done that. Um, can we talk about the- Kim, I texted Susan to send that message. I think you did. <laughs> I just made that <laughs> No, no, Susan will move me. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> so Paul sent me that message. Thank you, Paul. Um, now, if we talk about the buckets of money that people, you know, plans, in fact, I just need to say the thing that I get phone calls, the most distressed phone calls about on a regular basis are people who are at the end of a plan and starting to go through their new one or the plans expired and they're doing their new one. And these are um, often their mums or dads who've done several plans now, but each one brings a new sort of hell in trying to negotiate a plan and sometimes it's because as you've said the they've underspent because of a set of circumstances and someone's pointed out with COVID restrictions um, there are a number of therapies being unable to be utilized so they um, uh, the question is what will happen to all the unused funding and will participants get their plans cut back next year because of what we're going through now um, that's a real Given what we've seen in the past, that's a real possibility unless the government relents on that, isn't it? I think, um, I mean, does the person asking the question want to give us their view on what the answer is? Uh, well, there's been a couple of comments about money, but, but what I'm taking about from this one is that given COVID, maybe there needs to be some special consideration as people's plans are expiring. You know, if someone's plan's expiring now and they've had 100 days of not being able to access, that perhaps there can be a recognition that it wasn't because they didn't need yeah. it. Um, we've got a, I'm just checking off screen. Has the Senate committee had the hearing on disability? So well, this is tomorrow. A big, yeah, yeah sorry. The inquiry. Yeah, there's a parliamentary committee which is sitting. I would like to take that proposition and get our senators to specifically ask that question. There is a 10% loading, but the government's talking about taking it off. Um, I, I, people with disability are actually more affected by this than a lot of other people because they've had greater challenges getting care of staff. Uh, they're at the back of the queue when it comes to getting a whole lot of things. Uh, but I wouldn't mind, Susan, I don't know what you think, but why don't we get uh, Senator Katie Gallagher uh, to raise this issue um, for plans to be extended for 20 to 24 months where the participant nominates that? Mm. Like if the participant's not happy with the plan, well, then we've got to work yeah. on it. But basically, why, why poke a, a sleeping bear? Why don't we just put the proposition, they roll over plans for you know, the next 12 months where the participant says that's what they want. Uh, I think that would be a, a, a nice solution, yeah. wouldn't it? It would. And that came from uh, Cooper Matilda Bernadette. And 
if there's any more information you want to send through to me or any ideas on it, please do. And we'll get that through to Bill for the committee. The other question that's come up on the same, um, yeah, the same sort of theme is, oh, and in fact, Taylor's asked the same question. So there's a couple of coming through as slight, slight delay. But the other question that comes up even outside COVID times is when you've spent one particular bucket of of NDIS money, but there's money in another bucket, why can't you just take, you know, from the one that's still got stuff in it for, you know, for whatever purpose? That's been a real bone of contention. You know, I've used up all my transport, but I've still got plenty in this area and I'd really rather be using it for transport. Um, that's a particular one for us out here when transport costs are really high. Uh, that frustration, uh, there's not been a resolution to that yet for people. Uh, your thoughts? So what's happened with the, I mean, we campaigned on the transport flexibility. I'll go to what I think is the overarching picture. Hmm. Some, this was about giving choice and control to individuals and families to be able to um, make scarce resources go further. I actually trust people with disability in their families to get it right. Um, but what's happened is they've adopted such a rigid approach to the price guide, such a rigid approach to categories of funding that this transport in particular, but not just transport, you get an allowance, one of three tiers. But if you live in peri-urban Sydney or any other part of it, you know, where transport, public transport's not easy to access and not disability friendly, mm. it's actually a core function of living, whether or not you get to go and socialise, whether or not you're getting to, you know, medical appointments, whether or not you're getting to work. So we had a bit of a win that you could use some of the other core funding for transport. Yeah. But it goes to me the deeper problem or challenge. I think there should be almost bandwidths uh, of, uh, of funding where you get a certain percentage to a certain area, but within that, you're allowed to tweak it. it, it you don't need a bureaucrat you've never met who in three months will be gone, uh, replaced by a casual or a contractor or a new LAC or just people telling you when you're allowed to change something by $100. I, mm. I think that's... But that's too expensive. It's, a, it's not actually saving money. It in, inconveniences you. It underestimates you. And it costs a lot to run. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, these questions might end up being a bit all over the place, but there's some fantastic questions. Someone's just picked up on the additional 10% charge and just asked uh, whether we've had any indication, um, Bill, about whether people's plans will be increased to cover the increased charges that that service providers are able to apply that extra tension. The answer's no at the moment. The government's reversing it. Yeah, right. End uh, of next month, I think. For providers, but for they've providers. never topped up plans. And they've never topped up plans, but for, even for providers, they're reversing it. Yeah. Uh, now, stupid, which is stupid, and we'll, you know, we're going to have a crack at that issue tomorrow. Uh, it's just okay, here's, here's one. Uh, look, I'm going to be. There's not. They're not coming in a in a simple theme. So we might jump a little bit all over the place. But I look, I don't want look, to miss. You're in charge. You're in charge. <laughs> That's right. Um, the one. There's a couple of questions about uh, kids with a disability in mainstream schools. Now, this is another one where there's some frustrations often from parents that that they can't provide, the NDIS won't provide for the things they know their kids will benefit from. Well, just talk to me about where we, how we take that issue forward. Okay, there'd be many, uh, the people on this meeting will be much more learned about the problems than I am, so. And they vary I, from state to state too. They do, and so I, I offer my views not saying that I think I know it all or indeed that I know much. But a couple of points that I've seen since the election, I've started to reimmerse myself in disability. One is I think there's a real juncture, like a fault line, um, when you go from early childhood intervention to school. And I'm seeing packages downgraded because the assumption is the school system will provide the out of school therapies that kids are receiving. Now they don't. That takes nothing away from the school system, but they don't. So we've had a number of fights where we've had to get packages reinstated for people uh, because the, the fiction is that the school system is going to provide the same service. 
So that's one juncture and we're very conscious of that and we've been fighting on that. But number one, which has been on my mind is I get why the NDIS is not to replace your schooling. Mm. But we have a separate states and fed and governments and the taxpayers pay for education through a separate heading. NDIS was never intended to be replaced primary and secondary education. But for example, I'm trying to work out how we can be a little less rigid or black and white at the, at the edges. At a special school, which is open between nine and four, what happens between nine and four is in the education budget. But a lot of these special schools have got excellent allied health professionals. And in some ways, it's a bit of a shame not to have some of those skills in the school able to apply out of hours to provide some further services, which help the school an additional source of revenue for the school, which doesn't contradict the educational role of the school. It's not duplicating it. But you just happen to have gathered marvellous OTs and physios yeah. and speech pathologists. So yeah, and, and people who know your child. Yeah. And uh, a lot of kids might be in the mainstream system but would benefit from some of the allied health professional excellence at some of these special schools if the school could provide this out of hours. So I don't have the answer, and I'm, there's a lot of people smarter than me on this question, but I just wonder if there was some flexibility there which would provide us. The participant's happy to fund the provider. The school is happy to be the provider out of hours, but we've got this bullshit demarcation which says because it's got the word school with it, can't be NDIS. I mean, it's not the only area where I see a demarcation which shouldn't exist. Hospital care is another big area of complexity. Mm. We're not trying to replace, use the NDOs to replace the health budget. But when you've got someone with a disability, having a care or someone who knows the person yeah. well, is actually cheaper than getting a nurse or, a, or a, someone from the health system to provide that care within the health system when they're not actually excellent at disability care. Mm. Subacute care. Anyway, so I don't have the answers on these demarks, but I do think they're ridiculous and we can be more flexible, but I don't have the answer. I'm not going to pretend that NDIS should do the role of the education budget or the health budget, but I just think that, you know, for instance, report writing in schools. Mm. The school will have a report about a child, yet when you've got to go for NDIS package, I hear stories that the NDIS won't accept the school report. Like, mm. why are we getting... Two psychologists to interview the same child. Or why are we paying for two reports when one report exists? Yeah. The other thing is within the school system, a lot of them do some of the sort of uh, legwork for parents in NDIS plans. So if you like, the system, when you've got a badly designed system, nature has a way of doing the workarounds. And so rather than us ignore that, why don't we look at how we make information flow cheaper quicker less expensive and more in the interest of the person yeah and much less stress for the for the people who are pulling it together and oh, so narell has asked what are parents of children over six outside early invention in uh, outside early intervention um who are told they need therapy what are they meant to do to get support if they're not diagnosed yet so that's for the over six uh, kids. So that's obviously well, you a diagnosis, yeah. don't you? Yeah, yeah. But that's a classic example. The school may have a view. Yeah. But why can't it's like two parts of your brain not talking to each other? You've got the government brain on NDIS part and the government brain part on the schools, but they don't compare, they don't connect mm. with each other. No. Um, I think there are other problems getting reports though. If you're in an area where either the report writing is expensive to get or non-existent, mm. I do get Listen, I, I don't fully understand how we work out all the costs of these reports. Some of them can be recovered once they've been accepted, but yeah. there's a cash flow challenge there. And anyway, I, I'm, my answer is not satisfactory. And, and listen to myself, given I recognise there's more work we have to do, let alone the government, and how do we make that more seamless? I think every constituent we talk to, um, there brings another nuance to it and we're constantly going oh that's another problem too that's not working um, now this is a this is an interesting one from from Lindy Lou who says why can't parents or carers be paid as an employee by NDIA as the carer at least until the child turns 18 the carer's payment from Centrelink is a joke we lose careers income superannuation and much more 
due to having a child with a disability and, and being the primary carer. Now, I know um, parents can do incredible things, but often some can still run businesses and, and do all of that, but, but others can't. Uh, so, you know, this, uh, yeah, I really feel for carers uh, and, and what they have to navigate. So I can understand why Lindy would be asking this question. Yeah. I don't know if I have an answer which will satisfy Lindy. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really difficult one. I uh, guess, like you can come up with some pretty clear examples where frankly, it'd be better to have the family do it. But where do you draw the line? Um, and whilst that intellectually is not a particularly nourishing answer, I, I met a lady who lived north of Bendigo. Uh, Bendigo is about 120, 130 kilometres north of Melbourne, and she lived, I don't know, out, out of there. And she was taking, uh, she and her husband used to take their uh, son with uh, Down syndrome to Special Olympics events all over Victoria. Then the husband, you know, got old and died, and, and you know, that, and she, she couldn't necessarily drive him, but she could, but someone else in the family could. If she used the NDIS package, she'd have to pay a lot of money mm. to someone to come from another city to taxi to take it through. She said it'd be a lot cheaper if she could get one of, you know, someone in her family to do it. And she had for years not asked anyone to do it because the husband could do it. So she said, I'm not looking to get something which we're not entitled to. Now, there is no satisfactory answer to that lady saying, why would we spend taxpayer money paying a contractor to do it? Yeah. But it's how do you work out a set of criteria which, I mean, every carer, every family member does stuff. And then you've got the paid workforce and there really wouldn't be a paid workforce um, the, the, if you went all the opposite way and just paid the family. Um, there's also issues around some family members take advantage of the vulnerable person. Um, but I get it's not a totally satisfactory set of circumstances. So I'm not sure what the answer is. I'm conscious that it's not black and white, but I'm also conscious that I, I can't make a promise that I, I can't deliver. No, no I, I mean, I think uh, the carer's allowance, when, when we look at what we're asking people to, when, uh, I think there'd be an opportunity for a, a, a review of uh, kind of now NDIS is happening. Let's look at what's happening, look at how they're interacting and working together. So, I mean, I think as we go forward, th this is never going to be a perfect system. And we're always going to have to have our eye on what's the next thing to, to look at and, and think through. I, I just think it'll be a constant work in progress. We just lost it. Oh, there we go. You just come I'm back. I'm saying I don't totally. There'd be circumstances where there is no one but the family to do it. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. So, anyway. None of it's easy. Now, um, uh, okay, lots more questions coming in. Here we go. But this picks up on it. I don't expect to be paid to care for my child, but can the NDIS provide support for carers? Um, we save the government so much money compared to placing a child in care, but we're exhausted. Services such as psychology, cleaning would make such a difference to us. And, you know, this goes back to the early days. Someone was talking to me through what she had to attest to in order to have her adult daughter um, get her NDIS plan and for there to be a provision for her to have some respite care. And she had to because in the past she'd been entitled to respite, but she essentially had to declare on her form that she would not be able to care for her, I think she was 27 year old daughter, if she wasn't given a certain amount of respite. And she wouldn't do that because she said, I am not gonna tell people that I won't care for my daughter because of course I'll care for my daughter. So this, she was actually an academic and furious that the system was forcing her to make that to try and get her to make those sorts of declarations. Now, I think it has improved somewhat, but clearly as Sarah Jane is saying, carers are feeling that they need more support in a, in a whole lot of ways. And, and that's, so yeah, that's I, an area to look at. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that the pendulum swung too far away from carers. I think in the early days of the NDIS that 
be it service providers or carers, they are viewed as not to be as trusted as the participant. Mm. Whereas the reality is, it doesn't describe the relationships people have. It's too black and white, the wrong way. So I do think that respite should be funded. Uh, I hadn't thought about uh, psychological care services, but that's interesting. I, I don't think the carer should be invisible in the NDIS. No, so no, I reckon, okay. there's, I reckon yeah. there's opportunity there. And we are very open to working how we include carers more and have them recognised within the context of the packages. And, and the state-based carers, I know Carers New South Wales does some incredible stuff, especially for young carers. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, always... Now, look, here's one. Chris Chris says, what's what's the view on the participant service guarantee? I think it's a good thing. Um, what it means, basically, is that the participant has some enforceable rights to quality standards. There should be deadlines. So Labor's been pushing this even from opposition. Um, the, basically, the NDS is not allowed to hatch a decision like an ostrich egg. It's got to just... I'm going to know how long ostriches take that. Let's not get lost with my metaphor. The point is, um, it shouldn't be... Decisions shouldn't get lost or take forever or shouldn't not be in writing. And, you know, for different categories of decisions, um, there should be timelines. Like, one which always drives me nuts is uh, assistive technology. Yeah. Uh, home renovations, mm. like, yes. why does it take modifications to cars? I mean, the government legislation on the on the um, uh, the guarantee participant guarantee has been delayed again. Like, just put some deadlines on. If you don't pay your parking fine within a certain time, you get fined more. The government doesn't make a decision about a wheelchair, which is essentially your legs, or about a toilet or about um, some assistive technology, motor vehicle, as Susan said, it can take forever. And then by the time you get decision, the report and the quote you had is out of date and you've got to start all again. Yeah. So, so we're very keen on that. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm just suddenly conscious, we've got about 15 minutes left and I've mm -hmm. still got questions that came in prior to tonight that I want to um, touch base with you about. One is to do with um, autism and the removal of level one autism. Uh, the argument being that if you provide short-term intensive support to this cohort, they'd be generally engaged in further education and employment and could in, indeed, uh, as, the, as um, Berinda says to me, f fade off the NDI NDIS support funding and be phased off that, making fantastic outcomes. So she is, Berinda is furious that level one autism uh, is not supported. Yeah, I, I've got a lot of sympathy for that complaint. Um, I think it's about functioning as, as opposed to arbitrary levels. And if some intervention can assist move someone and help someone, I, I think it's a complete shame not to grab that opportunity because it's a false economy, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Uh, look, the other one that's come up, which is very timely with Beck there working hard, is the um, failure to support people who could do with translators, uh, that the funding for it is terribly limited. I'm, I'm almost tempted to get Beck's view on it, but I don't want to distract her from what she's doing. <laughs> uh, how, I mean, are we making progress on these issues and are we likely to see improvements on those sorts of things, Bill? I think funding of Auslan uh, and the training of interpreters is going backwards. Um, where it gets taught, support people receive to study it. Um, Labor's opening to open to trying to develop a policy to give some greater funding support for Auslan. And we're getting more aware, you know, and maybe if there's an upside of national emergencies or bushfires or pandemics, not that upside's the right word, but you know, you, now if you don't have a, an interpreter there, Mm. You know, you, you view it as deficient. The problem is we've got to get more interpreters. We've got to get more resources and got to encourage more people to train. The people are there. Uh, we just got to give them that opportunity. So mm. to me, Auslan isn't, it, it's a language issue. It's not um, something less than that. Mm. 
Yeah. And now I'm going to switch to uh, a question that came from one of our providers. And in fact, this is Able To, and you and I visited Able To uh, not mm. that long ago in their Springwood office and mm -hmm. talked about their group activities that they do. But this is coming back to the pricing changes and um, the, uh, the nub of Sue's uh, letter is really that it's impossible to plan when you're a service provider yes. facilitating group programs for young people, um, you know, with the price guide and the changes to the price guide. It was already, you know, barely viable. It's now, it's become even harder. Um, and her view is that the overall, um, it's the running of groups is already high risk, low return. And, you know, for they have to, they have to keep their heads above water to be able to do what they do. So is, yeah, I, I don't know one, that you'll have that answer. Change, yeah. one, yeah. one improvement we could make is that if your child goes to school and has a sick day or a sick week, we don't take the funding away from that school for that child for that week. Yeah. When it's a day service, we run on such a sort of narrow definition of what we're paying for that if the participant isn't there, then the service loses some of the funding. Mm. That's ridiculous. There's fixed on costs. Um, I mean, you know, when a politician is sick and doesn't go to parliament, we don't take some of the funding away from parliament house. Um, so I, I think it's wrong. So I think we, there's more we can do. I think day services have been really crunched in uh, the COVID-19 time as well. Yeah. Um, of social distancing and how you maintain protocols amongst people who use day service is not easy but i really think uh they've been crunched and we desperately need them because for me day services are about quality of life a person doesn't just sit at home and wait to be fed and toileted and then pressed in the morning and put to bed at night it's about having an identity a life things to look forward to and day services do are a big part of that experience. Oh yeah, and part of the quality of life. Um, now I'm going to shift from, um, we've talked about early intervention and young people. I wanna talk about older people because I've had a number of people um, get in touch with me around what happens when you're older and trying to access NDIS. Uh, and in fact, um, well, this is one's just come through from Tara, who says her questions on behalf of her fit and healthy 70 year old mother, who's profoundly deaf and has missed out on receiving any type of funding to support her access to the wider community. When her deaf friends who are younger are able to get one on one Auslan interpreter for their needs. So that's one example of um, that, the, the um, I guess the discrimination you get when you hit 65, whether it's uh, the amount of service that if you haven't accessed NDIS before, well, you know, too bad, so sad. Uh, if I've got one person who's in, had to go into aged care, and as a result of being in aged care, it means that she misses out on what she would otherwise be entitled to if she were in her own home. Uh, and yet all her needs can't be met in aged care. She's only in her um, mid 60s. So these are some of the things that are happening. How, you know, what, what's your thoughts around older people and how the NDIS, you know, transitions into aged care or the fact that there's no allowance for overlap? It seems a problem it, to me. It is, although it's a sort of problem we didn't foresee at the start because when we were setting up the NDIS, the aged care assessment teams frankly, were much better than the disability assessment teams. Mm. Aged care had federal funding. It wasn't a hodgepodge of states and as crisis-driven. Something funny happened between 2010 and 2009 when I raised the NDIS in 2020. The NDIS is imperfect, but it's leapfrogged aged care. Yeah. Now NDIS packages are better than aged care packages. So somewhere something happened and we moved ahead and so you think it's got anything to do with seven years of liberal government mm, you could say that <laughs> you must be very good at cluedo you could work mm. it out the culprit of the room and the right, like sharp as sharp as so um yeah i do think it's got everything to do with the neglect in aged care so coming to what matters to people is support 
I'm agnostic about whether or not we better fund aged care or we better fund the NDIS to cover beyond 65. Uh, Julie Collins is our spokesperson in aged care. We've had conversations about this. I just want to see people get support. Whether or not it's done through one system or the other, I am less, you know, partisan about. But there's no doubt in my mind we're seeing disparities. There's a, um, there's a man uh, whose family run a, a pet food or in a, a horse clothes shop down the road from where I live in Flemington near the race course. And he had a terrible incapacitating stroke at 66. If he had had it at 64, he'd have got an NDIS package. Mm. He had it at 66, so the family can't afford the care. So they've set up a corner of the of this warehouse as his special day room, and he's he stays there behind curtains uh, because his family have got to go to work every day. But yeah, and, and listen, I talk to him, and he's you know he's happy to have the company. It's not all downside, but that's mad, isn't it? That yeah. it should be his stroke which dictates his care, not the age at which he had the stroke. Yeah. I think Rob, uh, Robert and Lil, who've written to me about a family member, just said, you know, what age is old? Who defines it? The arbitrary nature of it um, does lead to, to real gaps in care and, and inequity. It's just unfairness. Um, and now there's here, I'm going to take my glasses off to read this one because it's come up in small print. So this is from uh, a mountains person who says, I'm a nurse with a severe um, sensorineural hearing loss. It costs me up to 10,000 every five years for good hearing aids that can keep me employable. Um, and look, I wear hearing aids and I, I, my ability to work is um, severely limited if I don't have hearing aids. So I don't have the same condition, but I can understand the impact here. And um, she says, while I was delighted to be accepted, myself and my audiologist were dismayed to find that I was only given the Australian Hearing Services voucher for hearing aids that would be inadequate for her employment needs. An appeal was unsuccessful and she's ended up paying a substantial amount on top of the voucher for the hearing aids that she needs. Uh, so it, this is really about the access to hearing services and the voucher to cover a higher cost yeah quality of how, hearing how needs. old is, how old is that uh, person did you say? I think he's roughly my age so that would be mid 50s from my my recollection no mid 40s anyway the point about yeah, it is yeah sure she's yeah. between 18 she's between 18 and 65 yeah um, that's right this is an issue Five that of life <laughs> this is where um that's a slightly separate issue to the 70 year old person but it is a fiction that your hearing doesn't switch on at 18 and switch off at 65. Of course, it all comes down to cost uh, and how we support it. I'm, I'm sympathetic. I think I would rather support that than some of the money the government's wasting on other areas. So all I can say to you is that if we were in government, I can't guarantee you a resolution to the issue. I can guarantee you that we'd give us stuff and that we would look for a resolution. Yeah, I, I think there is a whole, there's a whole range of issues around hearing aids. I mean, we fought to keep mm -hmm. Australian hearing. Doug Cameron was yeah, he was great locally and nationally a fierce fighter for. It's such an important service and you know helps so many people. Uh, but yeah, the quality of your hearing aids um, dictate your ability to be employed or not, and your ability to contribute. Oh, I it goes to your, so I think it goes to your, it goes yeah. to your mental health. Yes. Uh, um, I, I think hearing challenges, you feel, you know, I've dealt with plenty of people in workplaces when I was a union rep who I weren't quite sure what was being said and they get frustrated and yeah. uh, I think it deals to tension, un, undiagnosed or unsupported hearing loss, mm. uh, we take for granted. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it... It can be so, so one of the things that can be so easily fixed. So my message to people yes. is if you're constantly being asked by your partner or whoever you share a workplace or house with, um, sorry, what did you say? Perhaps they need to go and have a hearing test. Or if someone's saying that to you all the time, go and have a hearing test. And it can, it really does change, change things. I'm a big now, fan. For, I'm a big fan, for example, of when we build new school buildings to install 
you know, full sound, full surround sound, which makes it easy for kids at any part of the room to hear. Yeah. All right. Now, look, we're running out of time. So I've got two quick comments and I love this one. Uh, the, the question was, um, how could we have more support for agencies who sit with the families and help them define their stories and needs better for their NDIS review and for people who advocate and support people through the process? Gosh, that would make people's lives better to know they had someone who could... What was that amazing place you took me to? where a couple had set up an organisation which had become... Yeah, that's, a, that's able too. That's the, yeah, the were, one in Springwood, yeah. I'm very impressed by the staff there. Um, yeah. Listen, we want to see more advocacy funding. Um, I, you shouldn't need a lawyer or an advocate to get a package, but uh, I do... I mean, I guess maybe it's my old union rep background, but sometimes in life you encounter problems that you can't sort out yourself. So having someone who's trained on your side with no conflict of interest is exactly what you need and government's the biggest beast in town so the idea that you can just front up and sort everything out yourself doesn't always describe the power relationship mm, no no I, look i think it it's also a confidence thing uh, it helps you through the process do you know one of the most beautiful things i've seen is people who have for years negotiated their own packages sharing their knowledge and expertise yeah. and and you met some of them when you came to Richmond we, we the had land. a forum yeah uh, th th look here we're going to end on a positive note because we know the NDIS is a fantastic yeah, system yeah. a fantastic concept it is life-changing and Andrew when it works a bit like the NBN when it works um, Andrew is saying, are there any parts of the NDIS that work? What is working well? So can a we lot of, get a lot of stories where it is working well? Very few people say to me, we want to go back to what it was before. Like that's a very small group. There's a lot of people who are frustrated. They feel it's become a new job just doing all the forms. And we've got to be on our guard that government doesn't use a digital system to individualise blame and put all the responsibility back on individuals. Having said that, I get a lot of happy stories. You know, as, as I think it was Doug Cameron who once told me the saying, Senator Doug Cameron, he said, um, when good news is getting up in the morning, bad news is already dressed off and running. So, um, you know, I guess bad news gets a bit more coverage. Yeah. But Andrew, I'm very optimistic about what's been accomplished with the NDIS. I just, but I'm even more optimistic what a bit of common sense and putting people back in decision-making will do under a Labor government then I think we can make it hum. Mm. It's reasonable. And, and look, I think that as an opposition, we have really been able to influence and bring about some fantastic things with the help of all the people who are affected by it, who are willing to stand up and tell their stories. And, you know, that's my thanks to people for their willingness to share really personal details of their lives so that we can help uh, make this system better. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll keep doing that, won't we? And please keep voting for Susan. She doesn't need to say it. But we need your, you know, maybe if you've got, you know, five minutes a week, we just need you building out a, an email to the system saying, hey, stop, or, you know, be part of a movement for change to make the, to make the NDIS what it was always intended to be, about choice and control for ordinary Australians. Look, Bill, thank you so much. And Beck, thank you for your time tonight. Thanks, Beck. Um, I'm going to follow up with, well, we'll follow up with you about the um, COVID stuff and we'll see what we can get out of the inquiry tomorrow. And I'll report back to people from that, uh, from those hearings. So if you have any questions that we haven't got to, I apologise. I've tried to cover off everything, but keep in touch. And this is not something that finishes tonight. We, we will keep talking about it. Thanks so much, Bill. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Lovely to catch up. See you later. Bye, Beck. Thank you. Shadow info.